Welcome. Thank you for joining us for this live Sunday service of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Northfield. My name is Janet Scannell, and I've been a member here for about eight years. UUFN is an inclusive community that nurtures spiritual and intellectual growth and fosters ethical and social responsibility. We are mindful that we gather today with different needs. Whatever brings you here, you are welcome to come as you are and take what feeds you. We extend a special welcome to any visitors joining us today. We look forward to meeting you during coffee hour. Thank you in advance for your patience as we continue on our journey with live stream worship. If you have difficulty, please participate as best you can and contact us afterwards for assistance. Please know that we offer our best efforts, not with the goal of perfection, but to allow us to continue to connect with one another while keeping our community safe. Welcome to the Sunday service of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Northfield. The opening words are from the UN Environmental Sabbath Program. We join with the earth and with each other to bring new life to the land, to restore the waters, to refresh the air. We join with the earth and with each other to renew the forest, to care for the plants, to protect the creatures. We join with the earth and with each other to celebrate the seas, to rejoice in the sunlight, and to sing the song of the stars. We join with the earth and with each other to create, to recreate the human community, to promote justice and peace, to remember our children. We join with the earth and with each other. We join together as many and diverse expressions of one loving mystery for the healing of the earth and the renewal of all life. Please join, me in, please join me in speaking the words on your screen as we, as we light the chalice, the symbol of our faith. Let us open our eyes to see what is beautiful. Let us open our minds to learn what is true. Let us open our hearts to love one another. Each week we gather, we carry the sorrows and celebrations of our own lives. If you have a joy or a sorrow you would like to share with the group, you can type it into the chat box and I will read it aloud for all those listening. You can open the chat box by hovering over the menu at the bottom of your screen and click on the chat option. I will begin by lighting a candle in honor of all the simple joys that are sustaining us. I will light another candle in honor of the personal and shared sorrows and hardships we might be carrying. I will light one more candle in honor of the joys and sorrows we carry in our hearts but have not been spoken aloud. 
we will share a moment of silence together. Some of us will experience that silence as a time for prayer, some as a time for meditation, and some simply as a time to honor what has been said and left unsaid. I invite you into a silence of your understanding. Joyce, please join us in singing the round This Pretty Planet. This is a favorite song of the Bill Jokola and Mary Jane Lipinski family. They heard it years ago and then sang it often with their children. It became their family theme song. The UUFN Choir, thanks to the miraculous mixing from Mija Vanderweg, um, will now lead us in singing as we sing at home with muted mics, This Pretty Planet. This pretty planet spinning through space, your garden, your harbor, your holy place. Golden this pretty planet spinning through space, down. your garden, blue giant, your harbor, your holy place. Golden this pretty The next reading is from Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go down and lie where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Well, I guess I think I'm on next. <laughs> um, I have the privilege today of introducing Dr. Mark Seeley. Um, and I'm, he's, Mark Seeley has been the, is the former extension climatologist and professor emeritus in the Department of Soil, Water, 
and Climate at the University of Minnesota. He worked in that capacity for 40 years until retiring just a few years ago. But I have a personal reason as well, because I've known Mark since he joined the faculty at the university, which at the now Soil Science Department in 1978. In his early years at the U, I was at different times a graduate student and faculty colleague of his when I worked there as extension soil specialist. From our time together there and, work, and several visits over the years, I've come to know Mark as a well-recognized expert in the field of climate science, an excellent speaker, as well as being very personable and caring and an overall great guy. While he did not grow up in Minnesota, Mark has family roots that go way back, and I think he'll say something about that today. In his role as extension climatologist <clears throat> and meteorologist, Dr. Seeley managed the weather and climate education program and did research and teaching. He served as weekly commentator of Minnesota Public Radio's Morning Edition news program, which I think some of you have heard, and written the we weekly Minnesota weather talk since 1992. He's also helped Twin Cities Public Television produce award-winning documentaries on historical weather events and climate change. Mark is author of Minnesota Weather Almanac, now in the second edition, and co-author of Voyager Skies, Weather and the Wilderness in Minnesota's National Park. Mark has been honored with many prestigious awards, including the SEAL Prize, awarded by the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resources for lifetime contributions of knowledge to agriculture. We are honored and very fortunate to have Dr. Seeley with us today. He will be speaking on a faith-based response to the challenge of climate change, perspectives from a Minnesota scientist. Welcome, Mark. Thanks very much, Bill. Uh, that was a very kind introduction. And um, I want everybody to know I, I have similar strong memories and admiration for Bill. And uh, <laughs> although our lives haven't touched each other on a weekly, monthly, or even an annual basis, I think we've sort of kept track of each other over the years. And uh, we're, we're a couple of uh, old men now, but <laughs> we're on the same wavelength when it comes to a lot of our thoughts, our feelings, our knowledge, our families, and things like that. So anyway, thanks very much, Bill, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm uh, going to share with you, um, I'm going to put the share screen on here. Uh, my intent, my intent is to share with you uh, not only uh, little bits and pieces of my science, but a little bit about my personal story and how I've uh, merged, if you will, my, my faith, uh, my, my faith with my science and with my love for community and um, I hope that'll provide some oh some ideas and thoughts maybe uh, attached to a little emotion that might provoke some wider discussion um, if not today uh, down the road a piece with your friends and your family and your community. Um, this opening shot is one I was proud of. Uh, back in 2017, I was asked to be the primary speaker of the science rally at the Minnesota State Capitol, which sort of like the Women's March, if you will, that also preceded that, you might recall in those days, there was a lot of reaction to the public uh, based on the election of uh, Donald Trump and the directions, if you will, that he intended to lead the country. And so uh, there was a lot of pushback going on and the disrespect for science was widespread and uh, we needed uh, as a community to push back against that. And uh, so I was happy to participate with that. And that, that's my daughter, uh, Emma, there with me. Uh, and uh, it, was it was so great to see that we had about six or 8,000 people attend that rally. Um, over the course of my career at the university, I had to deal with uh, lots of events, uh, many of them traumatic events. Uh, it's difficult in the weather and climate business 
to lay out an annual plan for your research and teaching because mother nature may not allow you to follow through on that. Mother nature may have other plans in store for your community or for your state. And University of Minnesota Extension was always expected to respond to these things. So you might say I, I was a researcher and extension specialist who would be light on my feet. And of course, my wife of 52 years, Cindy Bevere, would laugh out loud at any notion of Mark Seeley being light on his feet. But nevertheless, uh, we had to respond to lots of things. Uh, some of these uh, probably have occurred in your lifetime and you may recall them well. Um, I was a, uh, trained purely in an old fashioned way. Uh, environmental issues back in the 60s were just beginning to emerge. And I wanted to learn the science, if you will, of meteorology and climatology to sort of, uh, if you will, not only improve my own knowledge and understanding of how the earth climate behaved, but I also, uh, I, I was looking to develop tools and knowledge that would help people. So you might say uh, the first part of my career was very much of a pragmatic one. I, I was, uh, helping uh, Minnesota farmers, for example, develop tool, tools to better manage farming. I helped uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation with tools to develop uh, better methods of controlling blowing and drifting snow over Minnesota roads and highways and a variety of other things. But along about the early 90s, I was also caretaker of the Minnesota State Database Long about the early 90s, I began to see numbers emerge in our state data uh, that were way, way uh, outside the population of what had happened historically. We call these scientific anomalies, but we start to measure things more and more that don't seem to fit with what our historic climate was like. And this, this really captured my attention and I started to delve into the climate change arena more and more beginning with the, uh, with the early 90s. And the evidence wasn't just in Minnesota, the evidence was all over our country. In fact, all over the Northern Hemisphere was the emerging evidence. This chart from my colleagues at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration shows us how over the last 100 plus years, the mean annual temperature as measured by the uh, National Weather Service has changed over time. And in the new normals period, which we call the most recent three complete decades, 1991 to 2020, which by the way, you'll be hearing more about next month, you can see the oranges and reds are prolific across the country. And you can see that the bright red, which is the high, highest amplitude of temperature change that's occurred is right over central and Northern Minnesota. I, as it is in many of the Western states. It's been dramatic. This pace, this is a real important point to remember when people want to talk to you about the history of planet Earth and the fact that the climate has always changed on planet Earth. What is most disturbing about this attribute is the pace. So that what's happening now is decade by decade, the pace of this climate attribute is changing so dramatically. It's a pace of change in a decadal period that is equivalent to a pace of change that used to occur over thousands of years. So that's the most disconcerting piece of it, is trying to understand uh, this pace of change and adapt to it. That's what the real challenge is. There's an example of all our pool data in the state of Minnesota showing you all the warm years we've been living through. If you look at the right side of this graphic, remarkable in the historical context, we've been measuring, we've been measuring these attributes of the Minnesota climate since statehood in 1858. And, uh, and uh, we can see that uh, we, there's never been a period like it, at least in the measurement record. And similarly, in the moisture side of the climate, we look at the net change over 100 and some years in the precipitation, annual precipitation across our country. 
And once again, you can see that Minnesota occupies a part of the American landscape that has seen some of the most dramatic upward change or increase in precipitation. Wetter and wetter and wetter. In fact, the new, the new so-called normals or the new framework for averages for the 1991 to 2020 period show many parts of Minnesota, including Northfield, I would add, are anywhere from 10 to 35% wetter than they used to be. And that's again, a remarkable, remarkable pace of change to be occurring decade by decade. There's the uh, upward trajectory in statewide precipitation. You'll notice the data point on the far right-hand side represents 2019, just two years ago, which uh, is the wettest year in Minnesota state history. First time in state history where we had over 1,500 weather observers measure annual precipitation for us and the statewide average was over 35 inches. Uh, uh, just a, a remarkable change. And then embedded in that, of course, uh, what I've been talking about is changes in the mean values or the average values. We've also seen tremendous changes in the extremes and the frequencies of the extremes. So that the so-called mega rains, which uh, cause widespread uh, infrastructure and natural resource damage because we get a six inch rain that covers a thousand square mile landscape. Uh, since 2002, we've had a prolific number of these destructive storms. And the frequency, uh, the frequency changes, quite frankly, give those of us in the science and engineering community a lot of challenge because if we try to design things for what we call return periods, like how often do you get a five inch rain or a 10 inch rain or things of this nature, we have to acknowledge we're trying to design for a moving target. We don't have a static climate. We're trying to design for a moving target. So what is this frequency distribution going to look like in another 10 or 20 or 30 years? We're going to have to more frequently revise these statistics. That's the bottom line conclusion. And then, of course, the heat waves that affect all of us and this dramatic heat wave that affect, uh, well, Northfield, for example, in July of 2011. These are, still remain for the communities listed here. These remain as the all-time high heat index value, which is a measure of the temperature and dew point and how it makes our human physiology relax or react. Uh, and uh, we have all these values that still stand in the record books today, highest values ever measured. Very stressful, very stressful. And the frequency of these heat waves, according to National Weather Service statistics, is increasing in our neck of the woods. And lastly, as the author for Minnesota Historical Society of two versions of the Minnesota Weather Almanac, which is a complete history of weather and climate in the state, uh, there was about a 10 year span between edition one and edition two. And over that time period, when I rewrote it uh, for the second edition, I observed that over 17,000 new daily records had been set in that one 10 year period and 165 daily uh, statewide records, something we had never measured in history had occurred. I presented this at a national meeting a few years ago before I retired, and everybody in the room was startled at this pace of change. How could a state log so many daily records in just a 10 day, a 10 year period? It was a remarkable pace of change. In fact, it makes an argument that the pace of change in our own backyard here in Minnesota is accelerating. It's not remaining a constant pace of change. It's actually an accelerating pace of change. So we dovetail what the data show us with what we're observing in the world around us. And we have all kinds of things going on. And I'm sure you have read about these, if not personally experienced some of these changes uh, that have been going on in our lifetime. These require adjustment. These require adaptation. Uh, over the long period of time, these also require mitigation. We've got to slow this pace of change down. We have to find a mechanism 
to slow this pace of change down. All of these are very much right before our units, our local units of government, our state unit of government, and our federal unit of government in terms of looking at what's happening to us. Uh, the amount of flood mitigation work we have going on around the state of Minnesota is just a tremendous amount of work. They're listed at the bottom. Some of you might not know that acronym, M-A-F-P-M, that I listed there, but that's an organization that I salute whenever I can. It's the Minnesota Association of Floodplain Managers. They're the ones that are out there trying to help mitigate all these floods we've been having from these extreme rains. And, uh, and the molds and allergens, just for molds and allergens alone, uh, alone some of you may know that the uh, Mayo Clinic has formed its own climate change advisory committee of doctors that are looking into what all this is going to mean for public health in our state. And one of the aspects of this is already what it's doing to the mold and allergy season. So we have ready impacts going on already in our state that readily fit congruently with what's happening as we measure it in the data. So I can go all over the state, which I did in my 40 years. I've been to all 87 counties, hundreds of churches and hundreds of communities to talk about this problem and to show what the message of the data is telling us. But the aspect I've learned is that it's a more effective message and it provokes a little bit wider discussion if you not just show up and talk about science we can talk about science and in fact, we're trained to do that. Bill and I both went through that same process for crying out loud. I mean, you know, you're trained on how you're supposed to present science, but in a topic like this, that is so challenging and really mandates a response, a big time response, the more personable you can be, the more honest you can be about your own look at this and what it means in terms of your own values, your faith, your sense of community, et cetera. That's a more resonant message. I use my faith, which is a Wesleyan tradition. I am a lifelong Methodist. I was raised that way. And the Wesley tradition is to infuse our evolution of knowledge, infuse the things we learn in life, with the with, with this scripture tradition reason and experience in other words bring all those factors don't don't necessarily just rely on one thing that's basically what's going on here and um and and try to frame what your new knowledge tells you about what your behavior should look like how you should treat the world how you should treat others uh, anyway, it's, I don't know how widely this is, in, within Methodism, this is widely accepted, but I don't know how widely it's applied, but it certainly resonates and has a strong impact on me. And uh, so that's my framework. Um, Wesley was educated at Oxford, if some of you don't know that, back in the 1700s, and he was at Oxford when the Oxford Observatory was founded, and the birth of science was occurring. And so as a student there, he appreciated uh, natural philosophy, which it was called back then instead of science, and the linkage of nature, but he also saw the Earth system as God's creation. And he also saw our role as stewards of God's creation. And that the way the earth system behaved was not random and unintentional. It was designed that way. And um, I think this is an important message for me, or at least those of us that have such faith to, uh, to understand this. I also was provoked to share a little bit more uh, by this person. We all have our role models in life. We all have people we look up to in various ways. And 
these words from Maya Angelou re resonated with me that it's not just about what we as a scientist put down on paper or show up on a screen to somebody. It's what we say and how we say it. It's the human voice. Our effective approach to communications is to speak from the heart, be sincere and let emotion show in, in our voice. And so I really took that to heart as well. And then as Bill mentioned, the other thing that um, I care deeply about is this state and its people. And that's mostly from reading the papers and understanding what my own great, great grandfather did in this state. He came to this state in 1854 and was one of the first pioneers in Wabasha County. In fact, that first winter, he lived in a cave off the Zumbro River. Uh, I get a lot of family reaction to that about dad's family once living in a cave, but so be it. Uh, anyway, uh, he served in the territorial legislature. He helped write the Minnesota state constitution and he served in the first state legislature and until 1862. Uh, he had many challenges, early statehood, not, uh, had many, many, many challenges. And so communicating, compromising, negotiating, prioritizing, all of these things were on his plate. Uh, in the communications arena, I was lucky. Not, not all this is intentional, although we uh, sometimes like to take credit for being intentional about everything that emerges in our own personal lives. Some of it is accidental. I had some wonderful working partners throughout my career. I linked up with some wonderful people and the organizations that they represented. And um, I'm just showing a few of them that meant a lot to me and used them as partners. So what I didn't wanna do, and I think all of us think similarly, is when you're passionate about an issue and you want to serve as an educator, you don't want to do that alone. You want to partner. You want to find as many partners as you can find to effectively do it. And I think that's really important. You also, uh, also is to acknowledge what barriers or obstacles you might face. Uh, in the deployment of our scientific knowledge, uh, we go round and round on this. And I'm not saying this is a comprehensive list of dimensions with respect to human disparities, but it's nevertheless real to me. We have cognitive disparity in the audiences and individuals we're dealing with. Everybody comes from a different knowledge base. All of us are given gifts and talents by, by God in my view, but those are differing gifts and talents. And uh, emotions, my goodness, I, having worked with the Weather Service on aftermath public forums related to Minnesota disasters, I can tell you quite frankly that people have different perceptions of risk. Anybody who's lived through and survived a tornado or a flood is going to have a different perception of the risk associated with that than somebody who's never experienced it. Uh, and then of course, values and ethics, what's, in, what's important to, to people. And then these more and more in our lifetime, at least these entrenched political ideas and beliefs and what obstacles they are, but they should be acknowledged. They shouldn't be ignored. When you're trying to convey a message, you're trying to be an educator, you're trying to provoke people to think about ways to make their community better and more resilient and more sustainable. You have to acknowledge these things. Uh, you're going to be lost without doing that, in my opinion. And then also factoring in what motivates people. People are motivated by so many different things. Uh, values, duty, morals, beliefs, fears, money. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a calm, complex. I wish, I wish the word affection was a little more visible in some of our political leadership in this country. Quite frankly, I think it's starting to emerge, but I wish over my lifetime, the attribute of affection would have been more profuse, profusely shown 
by some of our political leaders over time. Uh, lastly, our, our faith attitude towards the issue of climate change. Paul Douglas and I share this attribute. Uh, Paul's written about it a lot. Some of you know him from his days uh, on uh, CARE 11 television or WCCO television, and he still anchors the drive time radio program for WCCO radio these days. But we put together a faith-based perspectives and action plan session for the National Adaptation Program at the River Center in downtown St. Paul back in 2017. Uh, we had 1,600 people attend. We had a very good discussion and it led to kind of a statement of faith on climate change that still stands today. And in fact, uh, God bless them, the National Forum, the National Adaptation Forum still advertises this at some of their national meetings. Uh, and you can see the words there, and I'm not going to read it in detail, but we stand up for children, grandchildren, and future generations. We stand up for the poor, and we stand up for creation itself, and we call for action on this. And uh, that, to me, is the key point here, is how do we get action? Working with the Minnesota Climate Adaptation Partnership, a statewide uh, group that's been meeting since 2007, we host annual meetings to hear from adaptation practitioners, community practitioners, public works departments, city engineers, mayor's offices, uh, uh, water and sanitation uh, workers, natural resource managers, farmers, architects, public health officials, and we share the practice of climate adaptation and what it means. And uh, we look at, for, for role models, we look for examples. We even have an awards program where we hold up individual organizations and individuals for their wonderful work in this arena. We, we are believers in a bottom up approach to this, that we think that it's gonna be the people that rise up and really do something about this, community by community and, and sector by sector within our economy. So these are some of the things the MCAP group has promoted and actually put some funding towards uh, over the most recent years. And uh, we've got, at the very least, at the very least, regardless of what your gifts, knowledge, and talents are, you can role model respectful stewardship behaviors for all those around you. And uh, sometimes we overlook that, but uh, you know, people serve as role models in a variety of ways. And then lastly, there's some resources I provided that uh, it's a take home sheet, if you will. I couldn't possibly provide all the resources I've used in my lifetime in terms of uh, uh, material about climate change, its impacts, uh, adaptation strategies and policies, and mitigation uh, 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 knowledge. So I hope this is something that can be used or looked at. Maybe many of you are already familiar with that. Um, that's my last take on this. I, I want to also say, uh, I, I, don't like, I don't like saying this, but I have to say it. Community by community, I've talked to enough communities in the state of Minnesota about this issue that if you feel it's important, then you should hold your all your elected officials, you should hold their feet to the fire. And if they're going to be dismissive about this issue, they're not going to give this issue a priority, and they're just going to be dismissive about it, I don't think they're worth electing again. I don't think they're thinking seriously enough about what it's going to mean to their community. And I, again, that's not a Minnesota thing to say, but I've come to the point where I've been before the legislature, I've been before the county, uh, the county commissioners, I've been before the watershed districts, I've been before the congressional hearings, I've been in all those places, and it's terribly, terribly frustrating. We've got people that want to be dismissive that's become too much of a big obstacle to me. So that might not dovetail with your ethics and observations, but uh, anyway, I, 
I, I think that's we've almost come to the point where we've got to get people that are going to do something about this. So that's my remarks. Um, I hope I hope I've given you a little bit to think about, a little bit to discuss. And um, Bill, thanks for the opportunity to do this. Well, thank you so much, Mark. You did indeed give us lots to think about. Um, really, really appreciate you sharing yourself with us today. Um, let's just see if we have like one or two questions from people. Um, if you wanna ask Mark a question, just put your name in the chat, then I'll call on you and you can ask your question yourself. Okay, Naomi, go right ahead. Could you release the screen, uh, Mark, to give us back the, you're still screen sharing. Yes. Uh, if Please you could just, uh, stop it, you mean? Yeah, just release the screen. Um, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if there's one, and sometimes that's really hard, or one or, or a precious few things that I, as we as individuals, and I'm just saying I should do immediately. Things, if I'm not doing it, I need to be doing it. Are there things you think of like that? Well, I, I haven't necessarily been an advocate for that. There's so many, but I've heard, I, I think some of the common ones I've heard of are um, if we all as individuals and families uh, within the context of the communities we live in, think more about the resources we consume and give, give that some priority. In other words, the waste, what's our waste footprint, our water footprint, What's our carbon footprint? All of these things, and, and can are, are there ways we can more effectively still live a good quality of life, but minimize these? And uh, there's lots of work going on. That's one thing that I think throughout Minnesota, and this is in greater Minnesota as well as urban Minnesota. I think a lot of people are thinking seriously about that, and um, and then as a church community or as a, as, as a group that identifies as a church community, a lot of churches are trying to serve as uh, role models that uh, really can show that they have paid close attention to this so that their waste generation, their water use, their energy use, a whole range of other things, they can show that they're really taking care to keep that uh, minimal, and in fact, maybe even subscribing to renewable energy. I know a lot of churches now that, you know, you have those options. You can choose, you can either, either put up your own solar panels, or you can subscribe to uh, a higher fraction of renewable energy for your, uh, your specific uses, and um, things of that nature. We have at our church, for example, in St. Paul, we have a group that uh, bicycles way more than any other group I've ever thought. They, they, it's, it's almost like a club. And they, uh, instead of using their cars, they uh, commit to, I think it's a pledge. Like, I can't remember. It's a very large number. It's like 40% of their travel is going to be by bicycle or something. It's some phenomenal fraction. And, uh, and actually, the, many of them not only uh, are living up to that, but they're living a healthier life. I compliment them. They're looking better. There's one, one friend of mine has lost 40 pounds doing that. And uh, so, uh, and he doesn't have to take so much blood pressure medication anymore, but. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Great, thank you. So yeah. Mark, we have two other questions in here. Let's see if we can get these in. Um, so John Owens, would you like to ask your question? I'll go ahead and read it from I, I oh. sense kind of anecdotally uh, from my own experience that it's like our springs are coming later and uh, falls are, you know, well, let's say winter is coming later too. Like there's a, a shift, an offset in our weather patterns. And I was over in India for most of a year and I noticed the same thing there. Like the monsoon started like a month late. And uh, usually it's over in September, but we were getting uh, rain even into, into October. So I'm just wondering, is, is that phenomena real or is it just a, kind of a one-off thing that I'm making up in my mind? 
Uh, no, you make a good point, John, and I, I didn't have time to talk about this. Besides the change in the measured attributes of our climate, uh, the mean values, for example, and the frequency of extremes, our climate's becoming more volatile. Uh, a, a statistician would say that the uh, variation is becoming more magnified. The variation about the mean values is becoming more magnified. And part of that physically is because the atmosphere is becoming of greater depth with the warming. The mixing bowl, the mixing bowl of the atmosphere is getting deeper at, at almost all latitudes, but, but especially at mid to high latitudes. And because the mixing is getting deeper, we're, we're getting into more volatility and uh, partially also because the change at high latitude where we're losing glacial ice and we're losing, losing sea ice so that the mix of uh, what the surface that interacts with the atmosphere, the mix of that is changing. And it's making the large scale waves and the small scale waves that regulate the atmosphere and try to keep the atmosphere in balance from a standpoint of both moisture and heat it's making it more volatile. And that's not gonna go away. This isn't a fluke. This is just what we're gonna to have to learn to live with. Great, thank you. All right, last question, Beth. Hi, and, and Mark, I add my thanks um, to your being with us today. Um, when you mentioned the word affection, um, in the mix of um, emotions and approaches uh, to, to bring into this issue, my thoughts went to young people um, and a, kind of a mix of thoughts about young people and change and attitudes and persuasion and affection that um, my understanding is that a higher percentage of young people um, care intensely about this issue. Um, I don't know if that crosses um, income lines or le education lines. Um, I have been impressed with how Citizens Climate Lobby teaches or trains members how to talk to legislatures, legislators without being sort of hostile or self-righteous, but to really build bridges. And I'm wondering if there is an, any efforts to talk with young people about how to, to kind of woo their parents um, to care as much as they do. I remember dealing, you know, when I had disagreements with my parents, I wasn't very gentle and affectionate about it always. There was this clash between the older and younger um, that seems to be part of growing up. But, you know, is there an effort to help young people build communication tools that they can take to their own families and, and try to build change from there? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent, excellent point, Beth. I, um, I've seen some examples of people that are very effective at that. Uh, it's almost, I don't, I don't know if that's teachable. You know, for us in the older generation, I don't know if we're capable of learning that or not. I, I've seen, there are some personalities out there that are really capable of doing that and talking through things and finding common ground and talking about uh, injustice and inequality in this world and why it's important to care for each other and treat everybody the same. Uh, but some people, I, I, I wish there was a prescription. I wish there was a teaching method, but I have yet to hear of one. I don't know. There's some people though in the movement, there's some people behind doing something about climate change that are awfully effective at communicating the message you're talking about and also communicating their affection uh, for, for all people. And, uh, and maybe some of them are gonna be emerging as the real true leaders of the future. I certainly hope so. Catherine Hayhoe, who is on your list of resources, not only for her book, but for her podcast, I classify her, if you will, in my view, she's a role model for this kind of communication. She's very good at it. Great, thank you. That's a wonderful thing, sentiment to end on. So thank you again, Mark, really appreciate it. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, the Hem Blue Boat Home. Please uh, join us, Reed Hendershot will play and lead the singing as we all sing along with muted mics. 
offering basket during April will be donated to the Division of Indian Work, a nonprofit organization serving, serving the native community in the Twin Cities and greater Minnesota for nearly 60 years, 66 years. Their vision is American Indian communities that build upon inherent strengths and create safe, healthy and nurturing environments in which everyone thrives. They achieve this through honoring native culture, educating youth, developing leaders, strengthening families and providing basic needs. You can donate via PayPal at Northfield, uunorthfield.org and select the share the plate designation. Or you can mail checks payable to UUFN with offering basket on the memo line to the address on the screen. Separate checks marked UUFN pledge are also welcome. Thank you for giving as you are able. Now join us in singing our final hymn, Spirit of Life, with our own UUFN choir. Audio mix from Mija and video from Paul. Spirit of Life.
Please join me as we extinguish our chalice here and in your homes. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Go in peace.